Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad that you're with us today to stay curious. Kicking off a new week. Hope you had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend as our museum was closed, but a lot of kids doing STEAM education today and a lot of visitors today here as May draws to a close. We got a beautiful crescent Earth here as only at, as only an Apollo astronaut has seen it. But guess what? Today in space, we've got a record 17 human beings right now at 4 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Daylight Time on May 30th, 2023. A new record's been shattered. 17 humans orbiting the Earth. Three have just went up. Three Chinese went up this morning. Four are coming back this evening, a little before midnight. And while another 11 remain up working hard on the International Space Station in the Heavenly Palace, Chinese's Tangong Space Station. Well, we're going to talk about those 17 astronauts in space a little bit today as uh, I welcome Marty Winkle, my co-producer for over 815 episodes. Marty, good to see you today. Thank you for setting stuff up. We know that Bill Whiting is watching in Farmington, Michigan. Welcome uh, to the program again, Bill. Uh, Cohen Gerkins is a planetarium director, I believe, in Germany. Hello to you, Cohen. I think we met down the road here at the museum a few years ago. And from Mott's Poland is Marius Krasinski. And Marius, thank you for being a faithful watcher. Stay curious. As is Lynn McDaniel in Tampa. Lynn had her students here in the springtime and has fallen in love with our museum. So, Lynn, uh, uh, thank you for watching today on Stay Curious. Well, Marty, we've got quite a day in space to talk about bringing humans up to up to the international their, their respective space stations and four coming back from another one uh it is quite a you just can't I, I get excited about it come on we have tied 14 humans orbiting the earth four or five times since uh the first time was in 2011 uh, or 2010 when we had a shuttle mission and a whole crew up there that was really big on the iss but uh, we've got uh, six uh, Chinese, uh, three people from the Arab nations up there, four Russians, and four Americans, I believe, all telling that. Maybe five Americans. So many, I can't keep track of it. It's like a, a, a freeway now going up to space and back. Uh, but it all started with not humans, but primates. And we're going to celebrate two primates here. As I hit the eye, I'm going to go ahead and make that bigger, Marty. If we do have problems today, we'll let you know. But a new breed of hero is, of course, our Mercury astronauts when they were announced in 1959. But animals, specifically monkeys, played a big role in NASA's early days of trying to figure out could living creatures sustain the G-forces of launch and, and re-entry. Well, on May uh, 25th, 1959, Okay, 64 years ago, over the weekend, two tiny female monkeys became the first successful primates to go to space and safely return. And we celebrate them right underneath our Mercury astronauts here in our beginning wall of uh, space achievements here at the American Space Museum. The monkey knots were called Abel and, and Baker. Their names were taken from... Uh, the uh, U.S. military phonetic alphabet, all right? Alpha, Baker, Charlie, and so forth. Uh, they are America's first space travelers. The seven-pound rhesus monkey, uh, Abel, and Baker was just a tiny little one-pound female squirrel monkey, were launched in the nose cone of a Jupiter missile. They reached 300 miles high, 18, 1,500 miles downrange, and successfully withstood gravity forces 10 to 15 times their normal weight. Uh, they were weightless for approximately nine minutes, strapped in their little tiny spacecraft chairs in there, uh, and they were successfully recovered. Well, Abel died a couple days later from an uh, infection and effects of anesthesia given to remove electrodes they'd implanted in the, the creature, the little uh, monkey. And uh, but uh, Baker survived and uh, lived to the age of 27, 
till 1984 in Baker. She's buried on the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And many of you may have seen Abel. That's right, taxidermy style. Abel's preserved at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington. So 1959 is when we started in retrieving creatures from space. And here, 64 years later, we're poised uh, at a little bit uh, before midnight tonight for the crew uh, dragon freedom to come back for uh, astronauts that are private astronauts of the Axiom uh, space group. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But got to jazz you up here a little bit with, uh, do I have your attention now? I think so. I think uh, Dave Stangy's watching now there. There's a UFO. There's NASA. Of course, I'm going to talk about tomorrow at 1030 is a public forum on UFOs, but they're not called that anymore. They are Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon, UAPs, all right? And at 1030 on the NASA channel, I'm going to be watching it here in our studio office at the American Space Museum as public forum is going to be had by the investigative committee that's been assigned by the government to look into unidentified anomalous phenomenon. Now, they were called it unidentified aerial phenomenon for a while, but UAP is the acronym, but you're going to call it UFO and know what I talk about. 10.30 is when this program is going to start, and then at 3.30, NASA is going to have their panel of, of uh, subcommittee uh, address what the public uh, talks about maybe you've one that has submitted a question uh, last week uh, to be part of this forum. So nothing like this has been done to my knowledge, Marty, where they vote NASA's opened up a complete forum <laughs> and maybe a can of worms uh, about uh, uh, our, this uh, unexplained aerial phenomenon that's been going on. And I mean, what the, the, the what the country has basically said in our uh, military forces is that these are not hoaxes. They are something that are unknown. Here is a uh, what they think is a drone kind of a cube that, that flies around and teases um, uh, jet fighters and then disappears. And then it can appear behind them instantly. So they're saying these things are not Chinese. They're not Russian. We're not confessing that they're ours all right so they are from somewhere else but where else is there you know aliens that's all it can be uh, uh and maybe that alien is technology from a million years ago on earth of a civilization that triumphed and then then disintegrated hey 65 million years ago these gigantic uh, lizards called dinosaurs were roaming the earth and they disappeared but uh, so anyway, we're going to hear a lot about this uh, over the coming days. And uh, I've already got a call in, Marty, to our friend Ken Bergerami, UFO expert. Got him poised to come in and uh, talk about this event, uh, if not later this week, but uh, next week. So, all right, let's get to our birthday boy today is Michael Lopez Allegra. Okay, and he was born in 1958. That makes him, yep, golden era 1965. Happy, welcome to your senior years there. L.A. is his nickname, Lopez Allegra, son of a Spanish father and an American mother. He was born in Madrid, Spain, but he was raised in Mission Viejo, uh, California, <clears throat> and graduated from that high school. Um, joined the Navy and become a Navy test pilot, all going through all the, the, the major steps there. But uh, Michael L.A. Uh, Lopez Allegra is a very unique individual, Marty. He has flown three spacecraft, all right? Of course, he was on the space shuttle as a mission specialist, and, and he did uh, uh, seven or eight spacewalks, total of 10 spacewalks in 67 hours. He is America's most experienced spacewalker next to Jerry Ross. And he's, he's the second most experienced in the entire world uh, next to uh, uh, Antolia Solyev, all right, who's got about, uh, I think he's got 18 spacewalks compared to Allegri's uh, 10, LA's 10 there. But he's one of the few people who have flown a space shuttle. Then he flew the Soyuz Russian spacecraft to the International Space Station. And then he was commander of Crew Dragon uh, Axiom-1. Uh, so he's been in three different spaceships. That is impressive to me. 
Uh, and uh, he went up as commander of Axiom uh, 1 in 2017. So here's his birthday today, and his good friend Peggy Whitson, who also works for Axiom, is commander of the mission coming back. Uh, maybe she's bringing a birthday candle from space for him or something, but I know they know each other very well. They work at, at Axiom, and that's why they hired these NASA astronauts, was to help train their astronauts to build a space station. And we've talked about that on future Fridays on Stay Curious last week where Axiom's going to put a four-unit module on the ISS, and then when their power plant gets up, they're going to break away and want to take $20 million from you, Marty, so you can go up there for eight or ten days and have a nice vacation. Can I go with you? We'll do a... <laughs> yeah, if you pay. <laughs> if, I, if I pay? Okay. Well, I got something out of you there on our UCAC family microphone. We know the UCAC brothers are watching from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And uh, but uh, quite an interesting guy, uh, uh, Michael Lopez Allegra. Happy 65th birthday to him. He still has a lot to give uh, to the space community. Well, let's get back to what we're. Oh, there, there's a great picture of him. Uh, uh, should have been that up there. There's the uh, SpaceX uh, docking there, and that's what he looks like today. Uh, and a uh, uh, good looking uh, senior citizen there, Marty. So, well. 17 humans now orbiting the Earth at this very moment. It's only going to last till about, uh, oh, midnight tonight. Let me see if I can get to my advanced notes. Uh, SpaceX uh, Dragon undocked from the space uh, port uh, at ISS Harmony Mode, 11.05 this morning. Uh, the second all-private uh, crew. They're going to target 11.04 p.m. Uh, tonight, Marty, and they're going to splash down off the coast of Panama City, Florida, up there at the Panhandle, right near Pensacola Air, uh, Navy Base. Perfect place for them to, to launch down. I'll be watching live with you all on uh, uh, NASA Channel today when that happens. Uh, uh, but So we've got seven on the ISS right now, four on Dragon Freedom, six in the Tangong Space Station as the... Three astronaut cosmonauts, they call them they call them tachyonauts, Chinese does. The tachyonauts docked about an hour ago, about three in the afternoon, Eastern Daylight Time, with the um, the their heavenly palace, Tangong Space Station. So now there's six Chinese orbiting in their rather small space station, about the third the size of the, uh, uh, about three school buses together. Well, we have about six school buses put together. Uh, but this picture I'm showing, uh, they haven't beamed up a picture of the crew yet. And this is with a woman in the background. This is the expedition uh, when they had six up there about a year ago. So that's just to demonstrate. But that was a photograph taken yesterday of the ISS crew in space, all 11 of them there. And uh, we're going to we're gonna go down uh, all of them here just a second. But... Um, 602 humans have orbited the Earth now as two rookies accompanied China's most experienced astronaut up to space. So how should we do this here? Let's go with uh, let's go with this picture, the wave goodbye uh, of the Axiom crew. They are now out of those spacesuits and leisurely enjoying their last looks at Earth from about 200 uh, and some miles above it. The space station is about 250 miles up, okay? In there left to right, you have, um, uh, you've got uh, uh, Rayana uh, Bar Barnawal, nine days in space, these three rookies will have when they come back. John Schaffner, well, in, is uh, next so from left to right. Uh, he's the first uh, uh, person to go to space from Alaska, okay? And... Um, then you've got Peggy Whitson. <clears throat> when she lands tonight, she will have 700, 675 days in space. Uh, she'd have 666, so getting off that number is good. <laughs> She's got seven, 665 days with tonight's splashdown. And then beside her is John Schaffner, 90 days. No, yeah, that, yeah, that's John. And then Peggy's the third one. And then uh, you've got Ali Alcarni and his nine days in space. Now, what Alcarni and Schaffner are doing, 
from uh, 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 an Arab nation is they are learning how to get along in space, what they have to do in space uh, to build these modules that Axiom is going to put up. So I'll bet they return to space uh, uh, really in the next year or so, we hope. And as recruit, there is the launch. If you wanted to know what a uh, human-rated rocket for China looks like, they have strap-on boosters there, Marty, on the side to get it up there. Three Takio knots inside there, and that includes on the left Ying Haping, his fourth trip to space. He is by far the most experienced. Uh, now uh, his his uh, fourth vehicle. He did not go to the first space station. But he undoubtedly will be commander of this one and up for a while. He has 187 days in space. Uh, 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 okay. And then we've got, uh, no, he's got, uh, no, he doesn't. He. I'm sorry, I forgot to write down his days in space. I think it's around 45 because he didn't do an extended mission. The guy in the middle is a rookie, Gu Hao Chu, his first day in space right now. And then you got Zhu Yang Zi there, his first day in space. So a uh, very experienced commander with two rookies. So right now they're they're docked with their other three Takio knots up there. This is the Shenzhou spacecraft. Looks a lot like the Russian Soyuz that's been in service for over 40 years. Uh, wish we still had the Apollo command module and service module as a ferry ship. Uh, we should have, but we don't. There's the docking collar, and then you have the, the center section is what the cosmonauts and Takionauts ride to space and back, and then the service module that is discarded before re-entry is in the back there with the solar panels providing energy. And there's a, a uh, rendition of the Tangong Heavenly Palace space station as it's completed. Uh, I couldn't find one, Marty. I've looked and look, looked for days of the Tangong Space Station from a spacecraft approaching it. Maybe we'll get some shots uh, from this trip to it. And I went backwards there. So there are the other three uh, Takio knots on board. All right. They have been up there for uh, 182 days now. All right. So 30 days. They've been up there about six months. They're going to come back next uh, a couple weeks, uh, I believe even next week. They're doing six months tour of duties up there. And the commander, Fei Young Long, has been up there. Uh, he did a five-day space mission before. So he has 187 days. Dong Quingmong and Zhang Lui has 182 days in space as of this moment. That, that Chinese is flowing off my tongue, isn't it, Marty? Uh, about like the Russian guys that I'm going to get to here next. You know we love patches and talk about the meaningfulness of these patches. Don't know any meaning behind this one except the Shenzhou 16 spacecraft uh, has docked to the uh, Tangong Space Station. And uh, you got the flames of liftoff there and so forth. So uh, Chinese also love their artwork. And here is the artwork of Expedition 69 going on right now. In November, we will mark the Expedition 1 beginning 23 years ago, okay? Uh, so we have uh, uh, up there on the uh, space station right now, there's the whole crew up there. All right, among that group is uh, Sergei Propakov. He's got 448 days total today. Dmitry Petlon, 251 days. And Andrea Fediev, 89 days in space. All right. Also in that mix, so you got three, uh, three, uh, Rus uh, three Russians up there. And we talked about the uh, three Arabs up there. You got Sultan Al Nayadia, his 14 days in space is the same as Steve Bowen and Woody Hobart, uh, Hobart. Woody Hobart and Steve Bowen have 14 days along with the Sultan. They've been up there since the uh, uh, Crew Dragon uh, 2 docked with them. Uh, or that had been Expedition Crew 6, uh, 5. We're up to 5 on the plus the demo. And Frank Rubio is in there. 250 days in space. I think Frank's got the... Uh, microphone there and he may be up there for over a year as rubio bowen uh, no rubio um papaka uh, and three of the two of the russians are scheduled to come back 
uh, after, in about, uh, I, I forget when, I think even November. Somebody may correct me out there. But there's all, named off all 17 people in space, Marty. Pretty good, huh? There is the uh, Crew Dragon. We always forget that the, the trunk part of it there, the service module, has the avionics, some of the life support systems, communication things uh, on this virtually autonomous spacecraft that when they undocked at 1105, it was in the dark side of the Earth. You could see the astronauts in those windows there, Marty, peeking out as they were slowly going away. Um, uh, they'll complete nine days in space with Woodson, Schaffner, Al Carney, and Barnawal. Uh, they'll have 300 pounds of science they're bringing back, including NASA experiments and hardware. One of the mission uh, things they wanted to do was work on uh, stem cell research is a real big thing that Axiom's doing because they're, they're one of the public companies that want to commercialize space. Uh, so we, we might see that, uh, what, what they're doing there. Let me get a little drink of Stay Curious Coffee here. All right, so the joint operations with Axiom and SpaceX teams end, and NASA's coverage of the mission concludes when... Uh, uh, the, concluded about 30 minutes after undocking. So right now, Axiom Space leads the independent mission for Axiom 2. All right. And they're going to, and then uh, uh, SpaceX will help them with the re entry and splashdown. Uh, so, Marty, that uh, I'm going to be, uh, us living here in Florida, not sure what the trajectory is, but it could be possible that we could see uh, the re entry coming in and they're going east to west so no they're going to come down uh yeah they'll come down we probably won't see them over here but someone's going to see the re-entry of that and that should be pretty cool well 10 axiom human crew launches in three years if you believe that that's amazing uh, and of course you believe it because i'm saying it here on stay curious uh the uh, this is what the space station's configured now there are four spacecraft now docked to the international space station all right four spaceships are uh spacex dragon endeavor cruise ship ross cosmos's soyuz ms 23 cruise ship all right together those could bring back seven uh uh, uh four in uh, endeavor and three in the Russians, so they're we're covered. Okay, they can get back safely, and then you got two progress resupply ships. Eighty-three, as you see there, uh, has been docked for a while, and uh, eighty-four just docked over the weekend with new supplies that they're they're working up in there. And there you see the cupola under there. So uh, always they come up underneath to uh, dock uh, from the International Space Station, and I believe that's called the Nader looking down at the earth there so uh like i mentioned 10 human uh space launches by spacex in the last three years marty uh the uh the uh astronauts uh, that are coming back did eight media events all right now and uh so uh we're very excited so uh uh get uh be be uh Watch NASA TV tonight, starting about 10.30, and the re-entry should be pretty spectacular. Uh, they have infrared cameras that see the parachutes deploy at night. So uh, looking forward to that, a safe landing. We wish that crew uh, a complete, complete safe landing return to Earth. Did you wonder, Marty, about the International Space Station and the Tangong, what orbits they're in, and could they ever have a chance of hitting each other? Well, you know, if there's a chance, there's a chance. So basically, here's some stats on it. Our space station is scheduled the last 25 years. It's been up 22 years. We're looking at 2030. Uh, is finally deorbiting orbit, it, sadly. All right. Well, the Tangong Space Station, they're hoping to keep up well into 2023, closer to 2040. And uh, they're going to put a, a big telescope up in the same orbit that can be serviced easily uh, by moving it closer to their space station. They're not going to attach it, but uh, it's about a third of the size. 
the living space is uh, uh, about like a, uh, I think they said the uh, space station's like a three-bedroom house, and, and this is more like, you know, a, a two-bedroom house, the Chinese one there. So, But I wondered about the orbits, and what orbits are these in? So here's the ground track. I took this at, um, I think, 11 o'clock this morning. Yep, 11 o'clock. I took both the ground track for the ISS and Tangong. And at 11 o'clock, the ISS was in the South Pacific Ocean between South America and Australia, while Tangong was just crossing the coast of North America. So they're both in this daylight and both kind of in the same uh, hemisphere, okay. But, I mean, they're a whole continent of South America apart as I go backwards again to show you that. Now, interestingly, the ISS roams at an altitude of about 258 miles, while Tangong orbits at about 210. But it can go up as high as 280, all right? Uh, so, yes, they can be in the same altitude, and uh, now, are they in the same orbital path? No, and this is very important to understand, as only an orbital rocket scientist could, uh, but uh, let's go back this way. Is there, uh, this flight path of our Tangong, look, it passes, uh, Kennedy, uh, it passes the uh, Cuba in the peninsula of of uh, Florida there, well, because it was launched from from us, of course. While the Tangong is going to go up, and its orbital path will shift over Kazakhstan. So, because of where they were launched in different parts of the world, they would have to do orbital maneuvers with fuel and so forth to actually make them crash into each other. So no chance of that, but they, they do appear to be in the same hemisphere at the same time, for now anyway. And uh, But now, uh, as we come into a good close here of uh, Stay Curious, I want to, to encourage you to download an app or go to your computer and, and uh, look up a website or two that I'm going to show you here how easy it is to see the space station go overhead. In fact, people all over the world are photographing the space station passing in front of the sun or in front of the moon. Very difficult to do. You have to have your telescope and camera just almost set on automatic. Of course, it's not a camera, conventional camera like you think of. Is you're going to take a movie and pull a frame out of there. As, as going at 17,500 miles an hour, this, any space station or orbiting object is going to take a half a second to cross the sun or the moon. It's a half a degree across. And uh, Sam Hawley's watching. I'll bet you know that. Doug Forrest, thank you for watching. Gary Gerald, thank you for the peanut butter I've been eating over the weekend. Love peanut butter. Uh, Dave Stangy's watching. Robert Law's up in Dundee, Scotland. Tamara Mayer. Uh, Litsa Della Portia. Uh, Tom Usiak and Bill Whiting. Uh, gave you guys a shout out earlier. And CB, Carlton Bailey. Dr. Doolittle out there at his ranch, uh, taking care of nature, uh, and uh, glad that you're all watching. CB, going to show you how easy it is to see the space station go over your property. Uh, about one week a month, the space station, International Space Station, and for that matter, Tangong and the Hubble Telescope, easily to see, are going to go over one week in the morning sky before sunrise and one week in the evening sky after sunset. You have to see the twilight or an hour after it gets dark. You're not going to see these at midnight because uh, the sun, there's no, there, uh, there's no reflecting light to hit them. You see the International Space Station in the dark. It's showing you the cities below where well, you can't see it unless you're, uh, there's sunlight hitting it. So... A lot of invisible passes during the day and during the night of the ISS in Tangong. But uh, to go to a, a website, uh, there's the ground track again. Here is the tough shot that was that was taken. This is Tangong Space Station, okay? Uh, how it looks right now, you can see, uh, as we showed you, it's uh, got the uh, two modules like this, and it's got one in a T, and it's got solar panels. 
The sun is very active with sunspots. Here's a row of them. Do not look at the sun through a telescope. Binoculars, it'll fry your eyes, but there's safe ways to look at them. The best is to go to spaceweather.com to see pictures like this. So you can go to Spot the Station is NASA's website, and it, this is what it looks like. Spot the station, and arbitrarily it gave me New York City. And there you see the station at the bottom is going over on a certain day, and uh, so you'd be looking to the south to see it from New York City. or uh, And it crossed over Florida there. So there you, you're going to see the time, when it's going to begin. It says 4 a.m., and uh, begins at 4.38 a.m. on June 1st, okay, and the duration is 5 minutes and 37 seconds. That is a very long, and you click that, and it'll give you a more detailed map. Uh, now, here are locations for Titusville, Florida, here where we're at, and there you see the dates, and it says visible for, well, let's take uh, tonight, one minute. We can see it, but it's not going to get much above the horizon, only 15 degrees. You take your fist, and your fist is 10 degrees, okay? So you got 10 and 20 degrees right there, all right? Three fingers is about 5 degrees. So your fist is about 10 degrees, so it's just going to get a little bit above the horizon, but you'd still see it. Uh, but a great pass is going to be, um, at, uh, it disappears at 58 degrees above the horizon, 45 is ha is halfway up from overhead and 90s overhead. So a little bit of geometry you got to understand to see it. And then I've got an app on my phone here that's called ISS Detector. And it tells me when the moon's going to rise today. The moon has already risen. That It's going to rise at 5.58 p.m. Venus is going to uh, be visible in the twilight at 8.09. Then Mars is right beside Venus, if you didn't know that, and go out and look tonight. And the ISS at, at 927, and it's going to be magnitude minus one point, but uh, it's only going to be 14 degrees above the horizon. But still a pretty good opportunity. And then another opportunity at 1102. Guess what? That's 90 minutes after 827. That is the orbit. 90 minutes it goes around. So some things you can see the ISS twice in one evening. So there's a there's a way to look at it and check it out there. Uh, this, by the way, yeah, that's ISS detector. Now, if you've got whether you have a, an Android like I do or an iPhone, uh, uh, like I know Connie McDaniel does out there, you can uh, download your app, a different app at your app store, and there'll be two or three to choose from. Go ahead and pay the extra two bucks to get the other satellites. Because uh, you never know when something's going to go up that you might be able to uh, have fun watching. So there's a lot of people, Marty, that track satellites on a daily basis and have a lot of fun doing it and photographing them. Like uh, this uh, uh, amateur uh, or this professional uh, astrophotographer took a picture of the International Space Station. And uh, this is uh, the whole pass. He had a special... Uh, adapter on there to chop it up, but this takes one one thousand one. It's already gone. One thousand. It's already gone. All right. But there you got the ISS passing in front. And twelve years ago, an amateur astronomer caught the space station and the space shuttle following it. What a these pictures are keepers. I'm telling you. I don't know the photographer of this. But there's, there's four or five premier ones around the world, and you have to be in the right place at the right time. And this is a photograph that will never be taken again, a space shuttle chasing the International Space Station. So, well, Marty, thank you for a wonderful program today, and we're glad that everybody is with us today to kick off uh, another week of Stay Curious as we end the shuttles of the month of May and get into the shuttles of June. And we're going to line up some guests for you here. We had an error-free program today, Marty. I didn't see any glitches. And uh, uh, we're grateful that everybody is with us today. We're going to dig into some space history tomorrow and uh, and have a good time just like we did today with you all. So, uh, And I'm thinking about, uh, yes, we want to remind you to watch the NASA channel tonight. 
probably about 11.30, uh, no, 11.05 is when they're going down. Trisha Brady, you'll be watching, right? Uh, of course you will. Scheduled, let me consult my notes. Scheduled to splash down at 11.04, May 30th, tonight, uh, near Panama City, Florida. Those beaches are beautiful. I would be there if I could to see what you could see uh, in the sky to come down. So, well, we hope you enjoyed today. Stay curious, and we want you to come back tomorrow as I'm Mark Marquette. And I promise you come back tomorrow, and we will bridge the space between us.